All right, you're not going to convert me, don't even try. Um, you won't be seeing me on Sundays. Uh, as an ex-Catholic, I really struggle with this God stuff. Uh, it's just a few of the things I said to Steve and Anne when I started here at Burley Church uh, a bit over 12 months ago. Amazing what can happen in 12 months. In all seriousness, seriousness though, uh, I'm Paul. I started here at Burley Church about 12 months ago as part of a work cover rehab. Uh, was not religious or had any faith whatsoever at that stage. I remember walking into the office about three weeks in here with my head in my hands saying to Anne, I'm really struggling, you people are too nice. I'm not used to nice people. What's going on? What is this? And the only thing that everybody seemed to have in common here was that they all believed in God. So I thought I'd explore that. Uh, talking to my son Lincoln, he, uh, he was interested in, in coming to church. He asked me if we could go one week. Begrudgingly, I, I brought him down. Um, he has absolutely loved it, loves the kids here, loves listening to Steve talk, loves Sunday school. Uh, and what do you know? You know, I'm getting baptised next week. Uh, it's just so different from what I'm used to. You know, it's nice people all the time, all the time. And that is very foreign to me, but so good, so nice seeing the impact I can have on people's lives just by doing really basic things, just things that, that Jesus is all about, you know, helping people, loving people. Uh, seeing the impact that that has on people is, is fantastic and really looking forward to, to doing that more. Well, good morning, Burley Church. Um, Burley Church Online, it's uh, great to be with you today. And uh, thanks for um, <laughs> thanks for tuning in. And um, yeah, I hope you hope you're doing all right. And look, just another invitation. I know we've got different people watching and viewing from different places, but just want to encourage you that if you're locally from Gold Coast, Queensland, we'd love you to investigate our community here. Uh, but if you're not, if you're watching from abroad, um, please reach out. We'd love to connect you with community. We'd love to create some community around where you are, whatever it looks like, wherever you're watching, please reach out with prayer and praise points. We, we, um, yeah, we just don't want to just deliver information. It's not what it's about as we explored even last week. It's about relationship with God and each other. And so that's the series we're in at the moment. We're talking about parables um, and particularly around the King and his kingdom as, as Jesus gave these parables so that people might reach and grow to understand what it looks like to live under the king and live in his kingdom. And so last week we talked about exactly this, why Jesus would speak in parables. And God wants us in. We talked about God wants us to listen, but he also wants us to act. Shema, um, listen and act. Uh, God wants us involved. Uh, church community, the living, breathing body of Christ is not a spectator sport. It's not a show. It's not a club you sign up and get discounts Thursday night on your meals. It's none of that. It's, it's active. It's participating with the divine. It's to grow. It's a relationship that affects and builds all other relationships in our life, church and non-church. And so I want to continue with this today. But first, I want to tell you a story of a friend of mine at a, uh, another church. Um, friend of mine at another church um, recently made some changes to his work week. He actually took a day off a week from a, a job that needed him, a job that still needs him, uh, a quite an quite a intense career choice. And he actually decided to take a day off a week to volunteer for his local church. He ran what we call a small table, a small group, and he wanted just to take a day to invest into that, um, not to fill it up, but to be with God and learn from God and learn from the pastor there and invest back into his local community. And um, it's funny hearing about this Christian young man and the different questions and concerns that church people come up with, that even his peers and his own boss and non-Christian peers came up with, things like, um, are you allowed to do that? <laughs> I 
I didn't know we were allowed to take a day off our work and negotiate with our boss or people talking, not knowing that you're allowed to be that sacrificial, people uncomfortable with him, even Christians, that he would be that passionate, that he would sacrifice a day of work, pay, that's building his future, um, uh, to put his job on the line, to seek after something. Um, people concerned about the world's teaching rather than the call of Jesus. And I reckon all of us as Christians, if we've been Christians long enough, and if you're not today, that's totally fine. It's welcome. Um, but those of us that are following Jesus would have experienced this at some stage, probably early on, uh, whether it's from church or outside networks and neighbourhoods, people understanding why we're so passionate, people even maybe trying to crush us, the excitement, trying to water us down, making fun of us even at worst, or even putting us down. Um, and this is... In a sense, exactly what Jesus starts to talk about is the second part of Matthew 13. He starts to talk about what it looks like to be a passionate, living, thriving good seed that takes the news of the gospel and serves the king and participates in the kingdom, even in the face of others thinking that's weird or strange or yeah, not, not the smartest thing to do or not the world's wisdom thing to do. And so like my friend, people saying, well, that's not building your career. That's not building relationships. It's not setting yourself up for the future. People find that odd. And so what, let, let's have a look at Matthew 13, 24. And so Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat. So Jesus has been ongoing about this, these different fields and he's been looking, walking amongst fields of wheat. And so he's using that as an example. And last week we talked about a different field and we talked about the seeds. And this one he's talking about the enemy coming in while they were sleeping and sowing weeds among the wheat. And then he went away and the wheat sprouted and formed heads, but so did the weeds. So weeds growing amongst the wheat. The owner's servant came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow just good seed in your field? Where did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servant asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling up the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them to bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. It's so easy to read this, and I think we do this all the time. As Christians, as followers of Jesus, we hear that the enemy planted seeds and we instantly go to the extreme. We imagine the enemy planting weeds or heretical teaching in, in his church. Or we imagine someone actively, kind of like a snake, slithering in and out of our churches and they're out to destroy and all they think about is when they get home, they look at their, their board and it's about destroying the church and they pray to their, their God, maybe Satan, and they're, they're about getting us and about destroying us. And we imagine that's what he talks about when he talks about planting weeds. <laughs> and um, that does happen. In some sense, there are people that are aligned with evil things. There are people that are out to destroy. There are people that take joy in corrupting. But in my limited experience, it's not the normal. That's not how the weeds look amongst the kingdom. It's not that clear cut often. Us as Christians sometimes, I think, want weeds to work like this because it allows us to deflect our own stuff. It allows us, it, it allows us to keep doing what we want because we think, well, there's no evil weed seeping amongst us. It gives us a villain. It gives us something to deflect our own stuff with. And so sometimes we want it to be that villainous, that exciting, so we don't have to turn it around and have a look at what it could be in a Gold Coast, what weeds could look like in a Gold Coast setting or wherever you are watching this, in a Western world. What does it look like? I think, a bit of my opinion, I, I believe that quite often 
in my setting on the Gold Coast, the weeds that come up amongst the good seeds look like comfort. I think it looks like resistance to discomfort, not wanting to be uncomfortable. I think it comes with teaching around God just wants us to be happy. (laughs) And I can imagine someone saying, I don't feel happy talking to my friends about my faith. Or I only want to talk to people I know about my faith. I don't want to make new friends. That makes me uncomfortable. Or I don't want to clean the bins out at the church. I don't want to do that. That doesn't bring me joy. (laughs) Or inviting someone that doesn't have a family over for Christmas. Oh, that's awkward. That's hard. I don't, I'd rather not do that. Those type of weeds, ideas, human philosophy, I see that as way more dangerous, way more growing amongst the wheat in our churches in a Western kingdom. Good worldly advice versus kingdom wisdom. Man, do you really want to give that up? What about your savings? Or how's this, as the disciples say, as the lady pours perfume over Jesus, they said, how wasteful is that? And Jesus says, no, it's worship. (laughs) Human wisdom versus kingdom wisdom. One I hear in church is some of the type of, uh, I guess, weeds again, ideas that seep into churches, into the kingdom is, um, this is a classic one, it's the pastor's or the leader's job. He's paid. Um, To be a Christian in a church, it's a common thing that um, the mentality is that the work of mission, the work of ministry is uh, kind of passed on to the pastor or the leaders alone and everyone else can vicariously live through them. (laughs) Doesn't work like that. That's a really, really destructive idea. Because, yes, it it means I have the privilege of being able to lead and participate in mission and ministry, but that's what the joy of living in the kingdom is about for all of us. (laughs) And so what these weeds I see in churches, not just mine, just churches across the West growing, instead of believing we are the church. It plays out like this. If I can give a couple of analogies to try to explain where I'm coming from. Here's here's one way I see a weed seep up and choke out some wheat. You might hear someone say, I don't need community to be a Christian. And then a few years later, I don't really need to listen to and obey what God says. That's religious. Don't put that on me. A few years later, (laughs) I'm really not into the God thing. I'm more spiritual. (laughs) A few years later, do you know what? Sometimes I just swim in the ocean and I connect to Mother Nature. I don't really need Labels. (laughs) Labels. <laughs> or it moves to, I don't have McDonald's on the weekends. And so I'm pretty spiritual. My body is the temple. Um, or I don't have McDonald's only on the weekends. Or it moves to, I drink light beers and I read the horoscopes in the paper. I don't really need God anymore. It's these ideas that seep up and they're not the big, evil, demonic ones that you imagine, but they choke out the wheat. They choke out the good seed that's growing. And it's always a bit of truth with lies. It's not clear cut. It is true. You don't need to go to church to be a follower of Jesus. But my goodness, the church should be the number one place you're craving to be. Gathering, encouraging you to be a follower of Jesus. It's truth mixed with lies that seep and choke out the wheat. It's the comments to my mate at the start of this story. You're giving up a whole day? What about your career? What about setting yourself up? Gee, that seems a bit full on. It's the blank stare from his boss as he makes this move. Can slowly choke the wheat as it grows. In my small time in ministry, I've seen so many seeds planted in the good soil. Seen so many people passionate ready to move in their cities, to give up everything to pursue this eternal kingdom, to be involved in small tables, to be involved in encouragement of the body, only to be choked, discouraged by comments or the general meh Western culture. 
So I have two questions to ask. One, what do we do about them? What do we do about the weeds growing up in our various places, our various communities? What do we do with those that are dispassionate? What do we do with those negative people and the voices in your life? What do we do about the jealous, the resistance, the cutters of tall poppy syndrome here in Australia trying to cut people down if they step out of line? The uninterested, what do we do with them? Well, this passage, and we'll open it up, tells us not to do a lot, (laughs) not to do much with them. Now, just a bit of a side note before we get into why we don't do much with them. If you're a leader in a church, let me just tell you, we are called to discern with people, to question motive and process. And, of course, being questioned and discerning isn't what I'm talking about. Having a group where you discern your calling, what you should move, what you should do in the kingdom is healthy discussion. And even encouraging pushback done in an encouraging way in trusted relationship is not what I'm talking about, choking someone, choking someone's ideas or vision or passion. And, of course, if someone is bullying someone in a church or someone feels unsafe, that's not on. We do stamp that out straight away. We don't tolerate, especially the vulnerable, children, those that are vulnerable, we, do, we don't tolerate that. We shouldn't tolerate that at any community. And so I'm not talking about that when we're talking about weeds. That should be addressed by leadership. I'm talking about those. I guess I'm saying if, if you give everything, you serve the kingdom, you give his love, his provision, and you're reaching out, you're really wanting to shema, listen and obey. When I'm talking about that person beside you on Sunday's biggest contribute might be to tell you to not be so full on or that you're in their seat. What do you do then? What do you do with them? Jesus seems to say, not a lot. The parable Jesus gives the disciples is to remind us again on whose crop this is, on who runs the kingdom, on who is king. This parable reminds us that we don't know the person beside us heart. We don't know their previous hurt. We don't know why and what has formed them this way. And we also have zero control of them. By all means, pray for them, but also pray that you can give it to the king because what they choose to say and do is between them and the king. We are called to what we're called to do, to find like-minded people to help build the kingdom. Their voices, their actions, their response to the invitation to listen and understand is not our burden. It's not our job. And what I'm talking about here is, is so hard. I've even put here so many O's on the so hard. It can be so disappointing. This is the burden of leadership. This is the burden of stepping out. It's way easier for just to ignore God and what he wants to do and and ignore listening and obeying when the people beside you are doing the same. It's so easy to be distracted by the logs in our brothers and sisters' eyes. It's way easier to do that than look at ourselves. It's way easier to do the mirror and look at the speck or the log in our own. Because we're broken too. But Jesus' first lesson in this half of the parable is to let it go to God. In fact, he's saying rest in him. If you're stepping out, if you are the good soil, not the good soil, if you are the good seed in the good soil and you are growing and you are doing things that seem wild and wacky and generous and radical to those around you, don't let them bring you down. God says, let it go. Let them grow with you and he will deal with it. He is the ultimate judge. Eternally, it will all come out. He will deal with them in due time. It's for you to sort out yourself and to listen and obey and encourage those that are doing it with you. That's his first lesson. 
It reminds me so much of the parable again in Matthew 20, another uh, farming analogy, a vineyard. And I won't read the whole thing, but it tells basically to paraphrase, it tells the story of some people working, getting some work at 9 a.m. during a Gold Coast hot summer. (laughs) And then the guy that runs the farm actually hires people at 4.50 p.m., 10 minutes before they finish for the day. And then at the end of the day, he hands those that were working from 9 a.m. and those that were working at 10 to 5 an extremely good day's wage, is extremely generous with them all. And those working at 9 a.m. spit the dummy because, of course, they've been working all day versus the guys that work for 10 minutes. (laughs) And I love this response. This is Jesus' words around another parable found in Matthew 20. He says, Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? You know what? People will live their life differently. You might live passionately excited from 9 a.m. in the morning. And you know what? Some people will just slip right into that kingdom mindset 10 minutes before the clock runs out. The question Jesus in this parable and the other parable that we're speaking, Matthew 13, 13, wants you to know is that's not yours to worry about. God is the generous God. God wants to do incredible things in you and with you now. Don't worry about the weeds or the people growing up beside you. That's for the generous God to deal with, the king of the kingdom, right? And that leads me into my second question and my final question. What do I do then? If we listen to the last week and the week before sermon where Jesus is king, he is Lord, and now we want to be the good seed that grows and moves and participates with the divine in the world, what do I do then? Well, he told another parable. (laughs) Just after this one in Matthew 13, 31, he told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, he said, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it was the smallest of the seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that birds come and perch in its branches. He told them another parable. (laughs) The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. Jesus spoke all these things to the crowds in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. So that was fulfilled what was spoken when the prophet, I will hide, I will open my mouth in parables, I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. Jesus asking them again to reach through parables. Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, explain, we want to hear, explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, the one who sowed the good seed is the son of man, him. The field is the world and the good seed stands for the people of the kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one and the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is at the end of the age and the harvesters are angels. God will have his judgment. Don't worry about what the rest of the world is teaching or saying or what they're doing in this cultural moment. Don't let it choke you being the good seed. Don't feel the need to judge or get them or make things right with them. By all means, protect, defend. We've already discussed that. God will have his say. Just carry on what what he's called you to do. Because you know what happened with my mate, the one that I'd said that stepped out this year and continued, took a a day off his job a week to sacrifice and serve his small table and the wider kingdom? You know what happened? Three weeks after he said this, another friend (laughs) who also in a profession where you just don't take a day off negotiated with their boss a day off so that they could serve. She could serve the church in the same context. She could run some things around the youth group and around the young adults. And it's because he gave permission to do so. And you know what's crazy? Fast forward a month or two, and there's now four or five of them at this church doing the same thing. 
And you know what? Mark, mark my words. You can hold me to this. Ask me in five, 10 years about this because those two people are youth leaders. And so every high school student that they mentor and lead now think it's normal for a Christian to negotiate with their boss a day off to serve the kingdom, to serve their local community. Imagine what that does for all those, say there's a 50 youth kids in that youth group. Say there's 100. All of them now have permission when they go to uni and go get a job that they can attempt to negotiate some time off with from their work with their boss so that they can serve their local church. Imagine what that will do, what that will build in the kingdom in 10 years. I've said it before. My experience is one of yeast in the bread, the mustard seed in the soil. I had a pastor ask me when I was in a very selfish, newly engaged era of my life as a young man. I've said this before, but I'll keep saying it. He said, will you, will you host a small table when you get, or a small group when you get married and you have your own house and you've moved in? For some reason, I said yes. And because of the investment that person made in my life, somehow eight years later, I find myself <laughs> pastoring a local church and speaking to you online today because someone made a small investment. Someone put some yeast in the bread and it affected the whole thing. It's the long game, church. Sometimes you don't see the fruit even in your lifetime. It's the long game Church, church. this is a call and I think it's for Christmas and it's definitely into 2021 as things start to get back to whatever we call normal. I said this th two weeks ago, turn up, gather your people. Turn up, gather your people, not just to church, but turn up to life. Gather your people. Make sure that if you're the yeast in that bread, make sure you're there. If you're the seed in that soil, if you're going to become the tree where the birds land and branch out, make sure you turn up. And yes, there will be people in your life that don't get it, Christian or non-Christians. Yes, there are people that will be angry that you get it. They'll be cross that you're stepping out. They'll be annoyed that you're not listening to the world, that you're stepping out. They might even make fun of you and even in some places in the world, they'll persecute you for it. You'll still love them, you'll still talk to them, you'll still pray for them, but you'll release control to the king whose kingdom it is and he can deal with them. In fact, right now, I'm getting a little bit more to go, but right now I'm going to pray because there are people watching this. I don't know with certainty, but I'm very sure knowing statistically churches and wherever you're from, I know there's people watching this that have been hurt, that have started growing a mustard tree. <laughs> <laughs> and they got knocked down by a Christian sometimes, but even a fellow uh, non-Christian, they got, they got paid out for being too extreme. They got knocked back for being too passionate. They got too involved, too sacrificial, too generous. Someone said that's wasteful when they didn't realize it was worship. And I pray that you can release that today, that that weed would let go of you and not choke you out that you could live the rest of your life doing what you feel God has called you to do with your community. Let me, let me pray for you and then we're going to keep talking for just a little bit longer. Father God, I pray for those that have been hurt. Maybe they don't even go to church. Maybe this listening online is the closest thing they can do to walking through those doors. Maybe they're church curious and they're curious about you, Jesus. Maybe that's been because someone knocked them. Someone told them, oh, that you, gee, you're a bit too excited. Maybe someone told them you're a bit too extreme. Maybe someone said, you're, gee, you have too much faith or maybe you shouldn't be that passionate or maybe you shouldn't be that Jesus guy too much. Maybe in moderation, they were told not to be that generous. They were told not to be, live, that, live that sacrificially. They were told not to base their whole life around this stuff. They were told not to dig that deep. They were told not to talk that that. That excitedly, I don't know, I'm thinking of more adjectives, Lord, but you know who they are. And they were choked out, they were hurt, they might even be completely burnt. Father, I pray they can release those weeds, they can release those things that were just trying to strangle them or maybe strangle them for a season and you can break those chains. That they can step back 
into that relationship with you, of participation with you, that they can, you surround them and they find like-minded people that fill them up, that encourage, that spur them on, that they can find community that pushes them towards doing what God is asking them to do. Father God, we release them now from that pain, from that hurt, from that resentment, from that weariness, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. And then the church, for those that are ready, be the yeast in the bread. Be the small seed that becomes a tree and branches out. Disciple, gather, serve. Be crazy generous. Influence. Set the temperature. An old pastor friend of mine used this analogy and I've always loved it. He said you can be a thermostat or a thermometer. You can be the guy in the room that goes, oh, it's cold, <laughs> like a thermometer. Or you can be the guy or girl in the room that sets the temperature. Who are you? Are you walking into places going, oh, people are not very nice here. Oh, I don't really like it here. Oh, I don't really know if I know anyone here. Oh, I don't know if I can reach out or talk to anyone here or they can be reached. Or you're the person on their knees going, God, change the room temperature. Give me a person to talk to. Give me someone to disciple. Even though the last six people I've tried to disciple, you might be saying, have not wanted that. Give me another one. Give me another chance. Let me find some good soil, some people of peace to invest into, God. The king has placed you where you are. He has given you your allotment in the kingdom. What are you going to build with it? Don't worry about what the neighbours are destroying. What are you going to build with what you've got, whatever it is? Let me pray again. <laughs> Two prayers. Let me pray again. And this is the final prayer for a fresh vision for you, for fresh energy, for excitement, for radical generosity in all areas this Christmas and in 2021 for the Spirit to stir over you the next few months as we come out of this weird, murky, feels like every day, Groundhog Day season of COVID and, and whatever's going on. <laughs> Let me pray for energy towards the race that you've been asked to run. Let me ask, pray for the part of the kingdom that you've been given under the King to allocate, to serve with. And let me pray for community that lifts you up and spurs you. Let me, let me pray. Father, the second group are those that are ready. The second group are those that want to not just listen and hear thoughts or just don't want to just hear stories of other people's endeavors or kingdom or mission. But Father, they are ready to do it, live it, <laughs> obey. They're ready to act on it, respond. Father, give them fresh energy in what has been a tiring year. Let them not grow weary. Let them see the race marked out. Guide their each step, Lord. Give them a mission field. Show them if they don't feel like they have any gifts or any, anything to give, show them the gifts and the allocation you've given them in the kingdom. Whatever it is, give them ways to serve and love and grow and surround them again with community. That is what the church should look like. Encouragement spurring yes discernment sometimes yes challenge sometimes but in a way that brings you glory in a way that expands not chokes out father release us from the voices release us from the weeds and may you have your perfect and loving judgment on all of that after all you're the king but Father, rather, as we come into a new year, a new season, show us the path marked out for us. Let us understand afresh that you are king. Let us understand afresh that you want us to grow and participate. And let us be encouraged and filled with your Holy Spirit anew this morning or whenever we're listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks so much for joining us. As per normal, the invitation is always reach out. If you've got questions, comments, we honestly love to hear from you. And um, yeah, hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll talk soon. Thanks.